Hello, my name's Simon Kerrins. It's coming up to 9.45 on the morning of Friday the 10th of August 2012. At least that's when this programme is being recorded. Welcome to the fourth edition of the New Look Sports Call. Coming up over the course of the next hour, we'll be rounding up the latest news from the London 2012 Olympics, taking a look at the pre-season preparations of Blackburn Rovers Burnley and Accrington Stanley, rounding up the latest action from the Ribblesdale and Lancashire Cricket Leagues, and much, much more besides. If you're listening to this programme for the first time, thank you for tuning in. It's great to have your company. And if you're a previous listener or a regular listener, many thanks for coming back. This is a special programme. Well, I like to think that every programme is special. But this is special because we're rounding up what has been a truly momentous time for Team GB at the London Olympics. We're also sharing your news, your thoughts, your opinions, your sporting likes and dislikes. And, drum roll, the minute I finish recording this programme, I'll be straight off to do an interview with a very special guest. If you were tuned in to last week's programme, you'll have heard me talking about Wilkin Motta, Warley's Indian all-rounder, who has experience of the Indian Premier League. Well, I'll be talking to Wilkin after this interview, and that interview will be going out separately on YouTube and available via Facebook and Twitter over the course of the coming days, as indeed will this programme. Now, since the last programme, I've had many positive comments from you, and that is great. Keep them coming in. Remember, Sports Call is your call. I used to say that two years ago when we aired on Ribble Valley Media. Maybe you listened to Ribble Valley Media two years ago. We aired between August 2009 and September 2010. It's incredible to think, but it will soon be two years since the demise of Ribble Valley Media. Two years, it seemed, since the demise of Sports Call, but it was always my plan, always my intention to bring back Sports Call, and that is exactly what I did a few weeks ago. And it's great to be back. It's great to be with you once again. The format might be slightly different in terms of how you access the program, but the main thing is you can still get in touch. Although this is not going out live, you can interact during the course of the week very, very easy to do that. You can send an email to Simon Kerrin's Sports Call at gmail.com. That's Simon Kerrin's Sports Call at gmail.com. If you're a Facebook friend, you can get in touch with me via Facebook. Very simple and straightforward to do that. If you do know my mobile phone number, you're very welcome to send me a text or indeed give me a call with your sporting news, views, likes, and dislikes. And if you bump into me when I'm around and about, then you're very welcome to give me your opinions. And whatever you do, whatever you say, I will share your sporting opinion with your fellow listeners here on Sports Call. Nothing could be easier than that. So where do we start? Well, there's only one place to start, and that is, of course, the London 2012 Olympic Games. What a success story, not just in terms of how the event has run, but particularly for Team GB. Now, I was looking at my notes last night, and last week I recorded Sports Call on the 2nd of August. And at that precise point, one o'clock in the afternoon, Great Britain had two golds, four silver, and four bronze. We got off to something of a slow start in terms of the golds, and there were just a few positive signs that better times lay just around the corner. Well, who could have predicted what would happen in the course of the following week. As it stands now, at 9.50 on Friday the 10th of August, we have 52 medals, 25 gold, 13 silver, and 14 bronze, making it, therefore, our most successful games since 1908. And there might be the odd one or two people around to remember the 1908 games, but the vast majority of us won't do, it's incredible to think 25, 13, 14, 52 medals, third in the medals table behind only China and America, and we're not a million miles away from either of them. I don't think we're going to catch them. It would be something off the planet if we did. But we have had a truly great Games. It's been fantastic. Yes, we're the host nation. Yes, we've invested a great deal of time, effort and money 
into maximising our prospects for success at these games. But the fact of the matter is, the competitors have still had to get out there and achieve. And my word, have they achieved. Before the games, there was anticipated dominance in cycling and rowing. And sure enough, that has come to pass. Take a bow to name but a few, Sir Chris Hoy, Bradley Wiggins, Victoria Pendleton. How unlucky was she the other night in the sprint, by the way. Jason Kenny, Laura Trott, etc, etc, etc. But there have been many other great success stories too. What were you doing last Saturday evening, Saturday the 4th of August? The chances are you were tuning in or at least keeping tabs on a golden 45 minutes for British sport. A truly golden 45 minutes for British athletics in the space of just three quarters of an hour. Jessica Ennis won gold in the heptathlon. Greg Rutherford, gold in the long jump. And Mo Farah, gold in the 10,000 metres. The stadium was rocking. It was bouncing. The most incredible atmosphere you can imagine. It was great to watch, great to listen to, great to be part of from afar. If you were in that stadium, if you had the opportunity to be there on Saturday night, get in touch tell us what it was like. We have an idea what it was like, but we want to hear it from you. Simon Kerrin Sports Call at gmail.com. The following day, there was more success, not least in tennis. Now, just over a month ago, Andy Murray was down in the dumps, and understandably so. He was distraught as he let slip a one-set lead against Roger Federer in the men's singles final at Wimbledon. There was no repeat performance on Sunday. Murray prevailing in straight sets, a crushing win over a man widely regarded to be the greatest player ever to hold a tennis racket. Murray played some superb tennis all week. It must be a perfect pipe opener for him as he prepares for the US Open in a few weeks' time. Now, when I was a child, and it wasn't that long ago, I used to watch show jumping at home on Sunday evenings along with Ski Sunday, two different sports, granted. And Nick Skelton was somebody who stood out then. And Nick Skelton is somebody who has stood out this week in a very big way. He's now 54 years of age, but he was one of the success stories as Britain's men took the gold in the show jumping. A truly incredible performance, winning the jump off against the favourites, Holland. We've also had to name but a few two goals in dressage. Catherine Dujardin being particularly outstanding, prolific in both the team and the individual competitions. Nicola Adams became our first ever women's boxing champion, winning the fly competition yesterday. Incidentally, congratulations to go to Ireland's Katie Taylor, who won her nation's first gold in the lightweight division. And when I say that, it's also the first gold Ireland has won at these 2012 games. Last night, 19-year-old Jay Jones, our youngest medalist, also won gold, this time in the Taekwondo. If I were to do what I did last week and take you through all the medalists, I would need a lot longer than an hour. I'd probably need a day to take you through everything. Interesting statistic before we round up how our local stars have fared. If Yorkshire had entered the Olympics as an individual independent nation they would have a place in the top 10 in the medal table. They've done extremely well, particularly um, Nicola Adams, who I mentioned a few moments ago, Nick Skelton, he's a Yorkshireman as well, and also the Brownlee brothers in the triathlon, winning gold and bronze. And had it not been for a time penalty imposed on Johnny, the younger brother, the chances are that he would have taken the silver behind his brother Alistair. Now, you remember on the very first sports call a few weeks ago, we were talking about Mark Derbyshire and his exploits in the triathlon. Well, Mark and his lovely wife Gillian, they were down in London earlier this week to watch the triathlon competition. I am sure they had a great time. I haven't caught up with them since, but I look forward to doing so very, very soon. The North West has also fared extremely well too, of course, now, Whilst this programme covers sport across the world, the very fact that it is based here in Lancashire means that we do tend to focus on Lancashire, particularly East Lancashire, 
goings on. Now Bradley Wiggins, as I was telling you a few weeks ago, born in Belgium, raised in London, but he lives in Lancashire, in Eccleston near Chorley, and rides regularly in the trough of Boland, the beautiful trough of Boland, not a million miles from here in the Ribble Valley. He obviously achieved great success in the time trial nine days ago, hot on the heels of his unforgettable Tour de France success. Jason Kenny from Bolton won gold in the cycling sprint, and he seems to have struck gold of another kind as well, because it would appear that he's in a relationship with the lovely Laura Trott, who has become the new cycling heroine of these games. Stephen Burke from Colne took gold in the cycling team pursuit. Sophie Hitchin from Burnley has set a new Great Britain record en route to the Hammer final, in which she takes part later tonight. Samantha Murray from Clitheroe will be flying the flag for both Lancashire and Team GB in the modern pentathlon this weekend. And just to explain what that entails, fencing, a 200 metre freestyle swim, riding and a combined run and shoot. She will sleep very well on Sunday night. Well, maybe she won't if she wins. She might be out on the town and who could blame her if she decided to do that. Unfortunately, Holly Bleasdale from Blackburn didn't hit the heights in the pole vault. She was very unfortunate. Lady Luck didn't exactly shine on her, nor did it shine on Fran Halsell, the swimmer from Southport. But they took part, they gave their very, very best, and both will be hopeful of future success. Incidentally, before somebody emails me or texts me or suggests it, we are trying to get some, if not all of the above, onto the programme at some point in the near future. Of course, it may take time, they'll need a break after their exploits down in London, who can blame them for that? But I would like to think that over the course of the next couple of weeks, certainly the next few months, we will have somebody on the programme, or at the very least, I will be able to update you on our efforts to get one of those Olympic stars to Sports Call for an interview. So to summarise, it's not just the best Olympics for Team GB, but we have the legacy going forward. Great interest, people taking up cycling, people taking up rowing, people looking at dressage and equestrianism, who previously didn't know anything about either sport, and so on and so forth. That is a legacy. And of course, apart from everything else, there is very much the health and fitness side of things too. One personal observation, and it sounds a little bit jingoistic and excessively patriotic, but I'm going to say it anyway. I've noticed, and feel free to correct me if you think I'm in the wrong here, I think that looking at the Team GB individually and collectively, nobody has an edge, nobody has an arrogance. It's impossible to dislike any of them. They compete with a smile, they compete very fiercely, but they're out there, they're enjoying themselves, they're proud to be representing us, they're proud to be part of the Olympic Games. Just like Usain Bolt, what a legend he is last night following up his 100 metre success on Sunday by winning the 200 metres. In doing so, he ensured that he defended both sprint titles, but he won in Beijing back in 2008. Is he truly the greatest athlete of all time? Well, it would certainly seem that he's the greatest sprinter of all time. If you've got a view, be it yay or nay, get in touch. Let me know what you think. Simon Kerrin's sports call at gmail.com. And certainly as regards the most decorated Olympian, then Michael Phelps, the American swimmer, stands head and shoulders above the rest. 18 goals, 2 silver, 2 bronze, 22 medals, the most decorated Olympian. Give us your thoughts on the Olympics. We are going to be referring back to them on future programmes, perhaps not to the same extent, but we will be looking back from time to time because we have had such a wonderful fortnight. The Games come to an end on Sunday. I'm looking forward to the closing ceremony, so long as Sir Paul McCartney doesn't sing again. Um, if you're listening, Sir Paul, that was a joke. If you're not... Um, well, <laughs> it's less of an issue. But seriously, it's been a fantastic fortnight for British sport. 
brilliant, a legacy to take forward, so many great memories, and I'm sure up and down the country in the days and weeks and months, and indeed the years ahead, people will be talking about where they were and what they were doing when so-and-so won such-and-such. -such. Okay, moving away from the Olympics for now, on to cricket. This time last week we were previewing the second test between England and South Africa at Headingley, remember, South Africa crushed England by an innings and 12 runs in the first test at the Oval. The second test at Headingley produced a draw, which means that England must win the final game at Lords in order to preserve their status as the world's number one cricketing nation. And their preparations for so doing have not been helped by the uncertainty regarding the future of star batsman Kevin Peterson. It would appear that there are various issues, various conflicts afoot between Peterson, his teammates and those who run the show at the English and Wales Cricket Board. So give us your thoughts on that. Peterson for me is certainly an outstanding batsman at his best, probably in my opinion currently the best batsman in the world. But he does seem to carry a certain amount of baggage around with him. Give me your thoughts if you agree or disagree. Do you think that England desperately need Peterson in order to progress as a team? Or do you believe that they could survive perfectly well without it? That's something for you to get in touch with me about over the course of the next seven days. And just a reminder for cricketing fans that straight after this I'll be off to meet Wilkin Motter, Worley's Indian professional for the 2012 season. He is a fantastic all-rounder, a great guy as well. I've met him a couple of times, and I'm looking forward to chatting with him, recording the interview, and making that available to you over the course of the next few days. The same, of course, goes for this programme, and it is available, obviously, on YouTube, but also via Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Twitter, if you want to follow us, then our Twitter address is at SK Sports Call at SK Sports Call. Get in touch via that means, along with Facebook and the mobile phone and so on and so forth. Plenty of ways for you to get in touch with me. Now, because of the Olympics, it's hard to believe that the football season gets underway in just over a week's time. In fact, the Scottish season is already underway. Disappointment for both GB teams at the Olympics, but excitement certainly rising ahead of the domestic season. Give us your thoughts. Give us your predictions. Who do you think is going to be rising and falling over the course of the next season? Well, we sincerely hope at 10.02 this Friday morning that today will not be the final day in the history of Portsmouth FC. I've mentioned them on the programme a few times. Today is D-Day. Today, Friday the 10th of August, is the day earmarked by Portsmouth's administrators for closure. Now, various efforts are afoot. I've seen many comments from former Portsmouth players and uh, lifelong devoted Portsmouth supporters hoping and praying that one, just one of those efforts is successful and it enables Portsmouth to carry on as a club. Incredible to think that just four years ago, they were celebrating winning the FA Cup. They were a mainstay in the Premier League between 2003 and the season before last. Incredible to think that they could be out of existence today. I sincerely hope that by the time you're listening to this, something has happened to save Portsmouth FC. Moving on from football, we will of course be returning to preview the East Lancashire preparations for the new season in a few moments' time. But for the time being, moving from football on to golf, the US PGA Championships, the final major of the season, got underway yesterday at Kiowa Island in South Carolina. And Britain's Rory McIlroy and Graham McDowell are doing pretty well, less well. Lee Westwood and Luke Donald. Luke Donald, my personal tip for the title. He's two over after the first round. He's still, well, in the hunt, provided he gets his act together today. Um, I did have a little wager on Luke Donald. Maybe that's what jinxed him 
uh, seems to be jinxing most of the horses that I'm backing at the moment. So if I can jinx the horses, it's only fair that I can also jinx Luke Donald. But seriously, I hope he turns things around, or at the very least, makes the cut, kicks on, and we have a Briton emerging on top at Kiowa Island on Sunday evening. That would be great. As it stands, it's the Northern Ireland pair of Rory McElroy and Graham McDowell who look best set to achieve that. Moving from golf to rugby league, we mention rugby league from time to time. I'm a big fan of Wigan Warriors, as some of you may know, topping the table at the moment, but coming under pressure from Warrington. And it's Wigan versus Warrington this weekend, the clash of the season so far, undoubtedly. One thing you may recall me mentioning, if you were a sports call listener in the Ribble Valley media days, I do find it absurd that at the end of the season, the team who comes out on top of Super League is still not guaranteed to be the champions. They get the silver trophy. You then have playoffs setting up a final at Old Trafford for the overall Premiership title. Can you imagine if that happened in football and Manchester United or Manchester City won the Premiership and you had then a playoff involving eight teams and someone like West Ham, he said tempting fate and dreaming, came in and got their way to the final, beat Manchester City in the final, say, and ended up as the Premier League champions. Well, as a West Ham fan, that would be nice. But seriously, it would be absurd. It would never happen for a team outside the top one place to actually carry off the silverware at the end of the league season. I think that's crazy. I think it's another example of television, formerly the vehicle for sport, actually now wagging the dog. They're the tail that wags the dog. And if that's happening, then it can't be right. Give us your thoughts on that. I'll be interested to gauge your reaction when I record next week's programme. Simon Kerrin Sports Call at gmail.com. Very simple if you want to get in touch. You can also do so via Facebook, via Twitter, via text message, via coming up to me in the supermarket or wherever, tapping me on the shoulder and sharing with me your sporting news, views, likes and dislikes. OK, the time has come to round up the latest goings on with our East Lancashire teams as they prepare for the coming season. Blackburn Rovers, of course, anticipating their first season outside the Premier League for some considerable time. The last time they played championship football was 2000 to 2001. And their pre-season preparations not helped, of course, by the injury to new striker Leon Best, who will be out until the new year. In the meantime, Rovers have signed Dixon Etuhu from Fulham. I'm sure the Danny Murphy connection proved invaluable there. They are seemingly set to sign former Sheffield United striker Colin Kazim Richards, who now plays for Turkey. He's based in Turkey, has been on trial at West Ham, and seemed a few weeks ago certain to sign for the Hammers. But we've released him, and it would appear that he is close to joining Blackburn Rovers, possibly on a permanent deal, possibly on a season-long loan. I'll keep you posted on that on next week's show. And at the time of going to press, Jordan Rhodes of Huddersfield, still of great interest to Blackburn Rovers. They reportedly had a bid in the region of £6 million rejected for the striker who banged an absolute hatful of goals for Huddersfield in League One last season. Of course, Huddersfield came up via the playoffs, so they'll be doing battle with Rovers, Burnley, etc., in the Championship this coming season. When you think about it, Jordan Rhodes was linked with West Ham and Everton and Fulham in the January transfer window for a fee in the region of £7 million. So perhaps it's not surprising that Huddersfield are looking to dismiss out of hand offers in the region of £6 million from a fellow Championship team. Anyway, Rovers conclude their pre-season preparations on Sunday away to Cork City in Ireland before the big kickoff on Saturday the 18th of August. And it's a tricky one. Away to Ipswich, who I think are going to fare a lot better this season than was the case last year. I fancied them to be one of West Ham's main promotion rivals last season. They never really got in a blow until it was far too late. They 
finished, to use horse racing terminology. They finished well, they stayed on well, but they were nowhere near the places. So they could be ones to watch this coming season. Will Burnley be ones to watch? Well, who knows? Eddie Howe has been continuing the pre-season preparations for Burnley. They're in action on Tuesday at Port Vale in the first round of the Capital One League Cup before their big kickoff on Saturday pits them against Owen Coyle's Bolton. Yeah, that'll be a bit tasty, won't it? Bolton visiting Burnley. Burnley kicking off the new season at Turf Moor. Accrington Stanley, well, before I continue to round up Accrington Stanley News, a huge thank you to Stanley Chief Executive Rob Hayes, a long-standing friend of the programme, and Stanley in general, for promoting this very programme, Sports Call, on the club website, www.accringtonstanley.uk. Many, many thanks for that. We look forward to following Accrington Stanley very closely in the course of the coming season, as we have done in the past as well. Who can forget that wonderful interview with Rob Hayes back in November 2009, just after Stanley had staved off the threat of liquidation and all sorts of other horrible things relating to HM revenue and customs. They came through it, they saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and they've kicked on. And Stanley are kicking on with their pre-season preparations by signing Carl Shepherd, the Irish under-21 striker, on loan from Reading until January. Now, Shepherd is very highly rated by both Stanley and Reading. If he wasn't, I don't think he would have gone to Stanley. But Reading very keen for him to get out and get some first-team experience. Now, if you think about it, Reading and Irish strikers have been a pretty good fit in the recent past. We think of Shane Long, we think of Kevin Doyle, we think of Noel Hunt. They've all done very well indeed for Reading. So hopefully Carl Shepherd is a star in the making for Reading and for Ireland, and in the short term for Stanley. James Gray, incidentally, has been called up for the Northern Ireland under-21 team. They take on Hungary next Monday, the 14th of August. Gray looking to do well there. In the meantime, Stanley have continued their summer signings by recruiting Tom Eckersley from Bolton and former Sunderland player Michael Liddle, both defenders. Liddle spent some time on loan at Stanley last year, and we've spoken in previous weeks about some of the other signings Stanley have made. If you're a Stanley fan, how do you think your team will fare in the 2012-13 season? Give us your thoughts. Simon Kerrin, sportscall at gmail.com. Uh, Stanley are in action tomorrow, Saturday, the 11th of August, away to Carlisle in the Capital One League Cup. And then the big league kickoff for them on Saturday the 18th takes them down to Essex to take on Southend, who were very close to promotion last year, narrowly missed out under Paul Storrock. They will be hoping to go one better this coming season. Clitheroe FC. Now, we always say we're very keen to promote Clitheroe. We're very keen to promote Clitheroe FC, do interviews and so on. If you're involved with Clitheroe FC in any way, shape or form, then get in touch. We'd only be too happy to go down to Shorebridge or go up to Shorebridge, geographically speaking, given that Shorebridge is further north than Worley. Go up to Clitheroe FC and carry out an interview and do some publicity for the club. We'd be very happy to do that. In the meantime, I can tell you that Clitheroe have received two boosts, one on the field, one off it. Off the field, they have agreed sponsorship for the next two seasons with the Mercure Duncan Halsh Hotel at Clayton Limours. Very nice hotel, very nice shirts. I saw them in the Clitheroe Advertiser and Times yesterday. And on the field of play, Clitheroe remain unbeaten in their pre-season preparations. They beat Airbus UK from the Welsh League 3-2 last weekend, followed by a 1-1 draw at home to League 2 side Morecambe. So Paul Moore getting things ready for his first full season in charge at Shorebridge. And next week, I don't want to tempt fate, but I'm hoping to be sharing various league predictions as to who's going up or down. Get in touch. Who's going to win the league? 
Who's going to win the Premiership? Who's going to qualify for the Champions League? Who's going to be relegated? And try and do that for the other leagues as well. The Championship, League One and League Two. I know it's easier said than done. And certainly that Championship, if it was a Premiership waiting room last season, then God alone knows what it is like now. Many more teams with Premiership pedigree, Premiership aspirations. It's going to be an absolute cracker. All I will say is... And I'm not going to say that they're going to win the league. I have a sneaking fancy for Hull City this season in the Championship. I might be in a minority of one, or it might be me plus the Hull City fans. I think they could be one of the surprise packages in the Championship this season. We'll be talking more about that next week as we preview the big kickoff here on Sports Call. Moving, though, from football to cricket, as we do seamlessly every week, to round up the latest action in the Holdsworth-sponsored Ribblesdale League. Kicking off with the leaders, Barn Alswick, at home to Edenfield. Now, Barn Alswick made 234 for six. Liam Bedford, 52. Imran Khalid, 60. Umar Sadiq, top scoring with 81. Edenfield were 41 for three in dire straits before the elements intervened and the match was abandoned. Baxenden, defending champions from last season, at home to Reed. Reed made 193 for five. Then we had rain delays. A new revised target was set, that of 173. Baxenden got home 176 for seven to win by three wickets and keep alive their remote hopes of defending their title. Clitheroe versus Paddyham. Clitheroe 152 all out. Paddyham 136 all out. Clitheroe winning by 16 runs to remain in fourth spot. Irby versus Ribblesdale Wanderers. Irby 158 all out. Ribblesdale chasing a revised target of 149. Did so. They made 149 for four, thus winning by six wickets. Great Harwood versus Settle. Settle batted first, 134 all out. Anik Hussain top scoring with 51. But in reply, Great Harwood 126 for 7, chasing that revised target of 126. 50 from Syed Shahabuddin, as they won by three wickets. Ozil Twistle Emanuel versus a bang in for Wally side. Wally 168 for 9. Lee Kearsley top scoring with an unbeaten 65. In reply, Simon Gordon took 6 for 41. Superb performance from Simon. Well done. As Ozil Twistle was skittled for 115. Worley winning comfortably by 53 runs, maintaining their great form at the moment. And of course, straight after this, I'm off to Worley Cricket Club to interview Worley star pro Wilkin Motter. That interview coming up on YouTube in the course of the next few days with links, as is the case with this programme, available via Facebook and Twitter. Final game in the Ribblesdale League for the time being, Salisbury versus Cherry Tree. Cherry Tree 156 for 8. Steve Brown taking 5 for 55 for Salisbury. In reply, Salisbury found themselves chasing a revised target of 136 and they achieved it for their first win for some time. Suthansa Pradeep top scoring of an unbeaten 84 as Salisbury won by six wickets. So as the season, well it has entered its business end to be quite honest but they're in the final few furlongs of the season. Bon Allswick lead having well, all the, the top teams have played 18 games in fact every team in the league has. Barn Alswick on 175 points. Reed in second spot, 144. Baxenden third on 141. Clitheroe fourth, 133. And to round up the other Ribble Valley sides, Worley have risen like a phoenix of late. They're now in seventh spot on 116 points. Still within striking distance of a top four finish. Ribblesdale Wanderers ninth on 101 points. Salisbury 11th on 80. Moving as we do from the Ribblesdale League to the Lancashire League. 
and then a repeat of last week's league game which was won by Lower House, Church will face Lower House in the final of this year's Worsley Cup. This after both teams recorded comfortable away wins in their semi-final. That final, I believe, takes place this weekend. Church defeated Accrington by 89 runs, amassing 277 for five, with pro Saeed Anwar, former Pakistan test star, making 93 from just 53 balls. Sam Holt also scored 55 for Church to put them in a very strong position. And despite an 83 from Accrington Zaidi, Accrington were all out for 188. To the other semi-final batting first, Lower House scored 219 with 70 from Joey Hawk. A very classy innings by all accounts. They then bowled East Langs out for just 132 to win by 87 runs. And with home advantage, Church will be looking to gain revenge for that league defeat last week. Of course, Lower House much higher in the league table. They are the defending champions. They are vying with Enfield for top spot. Enfield remain top of the table. And of course, we'll be monitoring developments in the Lancashire League title run-in over the course of the next few weeks. So now to fans' thoughts. Your weekly opportunity to share your opinions on all things sporting, be it local, be it national, be it international, be it Olympic-based. And just a thought, quite a few of these might have something to do with the 2012 Games. Colin in Darwin has got in touch. He says, the Olympics are inspiring. It makes me proud to be British. A sentiment echoed by so many people over the course of the last 12 days. 14, if you include the opening ceremony. And of course, we're looking forward to the closing ceremony as well. Beth in Clitheroe has got in touch. She says, I never dared hope for so many successes for Team GB. The only problem is that I keep bursting into tears at the national anthems. Well, you're not the only one. Um, and to watch some of the athletes, these established stars just unravelling with emotion. One thinks in particular of Chris Hoy and Felix Sanchez, who won the 400 metres for the Dominican Republic the other night, eight years after winning the title in Athens. To see stars like that completely unravelling emotionally shows just how much the Olympics means to them. To see the success, to achieve the success, and then to hear your national anthem as your flag tops the podium. Absolutely superb. Sir Bradley, Sir Andy, Sir Mo, Dame Victoria, I could go on. Actually, why not do the whole lot of them, says Aidan in Preston. Well, the staff at Buckingham Palace are in for a very busy time if that happens, Aidan, aren't they? But Sir Bradley Wiggins, I would say that is a certainty at some point in the near future. Dame Victoria Pendleton, why not? Big, big fan of Dame... Of, <laughs> I've, I've knighted her already. Victoria Pendleton, great star. So unlucky in the cycling sprint on... Tuesday, of course, she won the Kieran last Friday. Hopes were high that she would go out on a high in her final ever race against her long-standing Australian rival, Anna Mears. We know what happened. She was disqualified. She'd won the first leg narrowly by a thousandth of a second. She was pipped, uh, however, had the rug pulled from underneath her, disqualified for moving out of her lane, crossing the line. If you look at the replay... It's quite clear that Anna Mears was not doing her any favours, forced the issue, she bounced out of her lane, she was disqualified, no appeal. The Commissar's decision was final, and she was beaten, unfortunately, quite comfortably in the second leg. So, commiserations to Victoria Pendleton, but thank you for all you've done for British cycling and for British sport, I'm sure that damehood will come your way one day. Sir Andy, that relates to Andy Murray. Well, brilliant to see him winning at Wimbledon. Uh, the first men's Olympic champion for 100 years. Mo Farah, great achievement in the 10,000. He could well double up in the 5,000 metres in the next day or so. As Aidan says, do the whole lot. There will be people from outside that list who will be on their way to Buckingham Palace sooner rather than later, I'm sure. And, of course, there will be a special open-top procession. I believe 
that's going to be early in September to mark the achievements of Team GB. Next comment, as big a footy fan as I am, these Olympic heroes are much more in touch with us than the overpaid footballers. So says Claret Eddie from Accrington. Thank you, Eddie, for those comments. I'm sure many, many people agree with you. Hugh from Coppel has got in touch. He says, Simon, thank you for showing common sense. Read the national anthem debate. Some people always want to make mountains out of molehills. A little perspective never hurt anyone. Thank you, Hugh. But in relation to what I said last week when a few people were commenting about how certain competitors from Team GB, particularly Welsh and Scottish footballers, were not singing the national anthem. There's been, incidentally, some... I was going to say banter, but I think banter is making light of it, between Piers Morgan and Bradley Wiggins on Twitter this week uh, regarding the singing of the national anthem. Piers Morgan saying it should be compulsory. Bradley Wiggins taking a slightly different view. For me, just to recap on what I said last week, you have to bear in mind that Welsh and Scottish competitors, and the same would apply to Northern Irish ones as well, have not really grown up singing God Save the Queen. Okay, some in Northern Ireland may have done, but certainly not in Wales and Scotland. They're more used to Land of My Fathers and Scotland the Brave, Flower of Scotland, respectively. Therefore, it would be a little bit strange for them to suddenly start singing God Save the Queen as if their lives depended upon it. Yes, they're representing Britain, we know that. But, as Hugh said, a little perspective never hurt anyone. And I think it's important to keep things very much in perspective. You know, we don't want to be looking back at these games and the main thing that people have to talk about is who sang the national anthem and who didn't. I don't think that would be right at all. Lisa Jane in Bishop Auckland has got in touch. She says, I said a few weeks ago how good the Olympics would be. I was right. And more and more people are coming around to my opinion. They certainly are. Lisa Jane, they certainly are. Tony from Blackburn, as opposed to Tony Blackburn? Well, it could be, in which case it would be sensational. Yes, moving on. Uh, Tony in Blackburn says, over a week to go to the 2012-13 season, and I'm not overly bothered. A lot of people saying that the Olympics has really hogged the limelight, and rightly so, over the course of the last couple of weeks. Wayne in Abbey Village has got in touch. He says, for all the new signings, Rovers will need to move faster than Usain Bolt to get into a challenging position this season. I still can't believe that Steve Keane is still in charge. If anyone else was in charge, I'd be very optimistic about the coming season, but under Keane, I can see it all unravelling. Give us your thoughts on that. Dan from Paddyham says, I'm feeling a little underwhelmed after Burnley's pre-season. But as long as we stay up and beat Blackburn Rovers twice, it'll have been a great season. Thank you, Dan in Paddyham. And last but not least for the moment, Matt in Accrington says, I see that the bookmakers have made Accrington Stanley relegation favourites and 100-1 to one to win the League 2 title. Well, we've proved people wrong before, and I'm sure we will do so again. I'm sure you will too. So on next week's programme, we will be spending a bit more time previewing the coming 2012-13 football season. Send in your tips, your predictions, your hopes and your fears, as well as your regular news views, likes and dislikes. We are coming to the end of this week's programme. It's slightly shorter than normal because I want to get away for my interview with Wilkin Motter. That will be available separately uh, on YouTube, but also available via Facebook and Twitter in the course of the next few days. Just to say a few more things, um, we've spoken about the plight of Portsmouth FC, and I sincerely hope that Portsmouth will be able to survive today. Seemingly D-Day for the Fratton Park Club, who just a few years ago were firmly established in the upper reaches of the Premiership, winning the FA Cup, playing in Europe, playing some great football in the process. But really, things have gone from hero to zero, from top to bottom, in just a few short seasons. Darlington and Bradford Bulls have also been in the mire lately, along with, of course, Glasgow Rangers. We have, and I made this comment a few weeks ago, tried 
to get in touch with an administrator to get him to talk about the issues facing many, many sports clubs in the current climate. I haven't yet heard back from him. Hopefully, I will be doing so very soon. I mean, we'll get him on the programme to talk about it. I think it would be very interesting to find out more about the role of an administrator, the issues facing them, and of course, the issues facing the clubs in crisis. If you have any other sporting news, of course, get in touch. If your school is going to be doing something, if your amateur team, your amateur athletics club or football club or golf club or whatever is doing anything, be it for charity or you simply want to raise the profile of your sporting organisation, all you need to do is get in touch with me, Simon Kerrins, here on Sports Call. You can send an email to Simon Kerrins, Sports Call at gmail.com. You can get in touch with us via Facebook if you're a Facebook friend. If you're a Twitterer or a tweeter, uh, you can get in touch. Our address is at SK Sports Call. You can text me, you can ring me. You can come up to me in the street and get in touch that way if you so wish. One final comment to make for now. We still have those sponsorship packages available. Those regular slots that we've just actually gone through in the course of the last 45 minutes or so. It costs just £50 per calendar month for a slot. And you will get your name mentioned, your corporate name mentioned, or your individual name if you want to sponsor as an individual you will be mentioned during the program certainly during the feature that you are sponsoring but you will also be mentioned in all the supporting literature that we produce in between the programs well we're pretty much there now at the end of this the fourth edition of the new look sports call thank you very much for listening i hope you've enjoyed the program i've certainly enjoyed rounding up the latest news from the world of sport over the course of the past week. I look forward to your company next week. I look forward to interviewing Wilkin Mosser very shortly. And hopefully by the time we meet again next week, both this and the Wilkin Mosser interview will be on YouTube and available for your listening pleasure. So please get in touch. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Sir Simon Kerrins. You've been great for listening. I look forward to your company next week. All the very best for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.